lot of people here. <laughs> um, so I sit in an office at home and there's like a big screen in front of me and the only other person in the room, I can't actually see his face most of the time. So this is a little um, overwhelming um, to say the least. But I think um, before I get started, I just wanna share some of the, um, just a handful of documents so that you guys can be caught up to speed with what it is that I do. Um, okay, so this was my first um, documented ever. Um, you might recognize Deborah sitting over there. Um, just, I have to give her a shout out quickly that Deborah is my biggest fan who didn't make me or marry me. <laughs> so so um, thank you so much for coming, Deborah. My grandson calls me the cool granny usually, <laughs> but I am more commonly known as Deborah Darling. <laughs> Jane Fonda said, women aren't forgiven for aging. But even worse is that we, we've bought that. When I was leading up to my 50th birthday and guy at work said to me, you passed your sell by date. It hurts. That is, that is a, a, not a nice thing to hear because we've, we believe it and I believed it. I'm not and we aren't. We're not, we're not past our sell by date. My modelling career came about when I was about 53 and my hair had turned silver and I started getting a lot of attention. I had people stopping me in the street and asking me to take my photograph. So I decided to send my photographs to an agency in the spirit of trying new things in my old age. Since then I've done quite a lot of modeling work, a lot of TV commercials. And my Instagram account is very busy and it's been very interesting what's happened when you let your hair grow silver actually. <laughs> So I'm going to show you uh, about four more. Um, I'm not going to give you the backstory. Um, every document it has a description underneath it. Uh, it's hard to fit everything that you want to let people know um, in one minute. So I include more information. So if you want to find out anything more, documented.co.za. We clean the pins every Friday. Then month end, we go and collect to our clients. I pay the guys who assisted me, then I buy stock for the next month. Then if I'm left with a profit, I'll try and organize a screening, like booking a venue, and also go and buy popcorns so that I can just give the kids a, a cinema experience. There is cinemas in malls, and it's very expensive. So I'm trying to bridge that gap by bringing the cinemas to the kids in the disadvantaged areas. I don't like to show something that is going to encourage crime or something that is going to show violence in my movies. I need to watch the movie two times so that I know everything is safe. What's so important? Me, I, I believe one thing that a movie can can inspire and educate, and also can also create a safe space for the kids so that they can come in and watch movie and have that great feeling. That's that's why I'm proud of doing what I'm doing. Even if now it's still a startup, maybe we're not making enough money, but yeah, it's gonna grow. Once we start it, we, we don't quit. My name is Brandon Stanton, and I'm the creator of Humans of New York. Humans of New York is a collection of about 10,000 stories from random individuals, both in New York and around the world. It started as just photography. I had a goal to photograph 10,000 people on the streets of New York, and along the way I started having conversations with the people that I was photographing. Those conversations turned out to be the more interesting part of the interaction. About half the people say no. It varies from you know place to place. I've had a lot of luck in South Africa. About 80 to 90 percent of the people allowed me to interview them. If you have a sincere interest in somebody and you're asking with genuine curiosity, there's really nothing that people are unwilling to discuss. I think what you see when you're looking at a photo of a random person on the street corner and you're learning these kind of you know, intimate details of their life is the realization that these struggles and these challenges that people are going through could be anyone that you walk by. All right, I got enough. Um, this next one, I know I said I wasn't gonna give you any backstory, but I realize I actually do, do need to. So um, I made a document on um, Batis, who's sitting over there um, by Deborah. Um, Batis is a very talented um, ballet dancer, among other things, and after his document had came out, he told us about this little boy named Nati. 
Um, I'm not going to give too much away, but after this video, within 24 hours, we were able to raise um, 25,000 Rand for Nati to go to ballet school, and that's because of Batas. My name is Stephen Arthur Dima and I'm 12 years old. I really like dancing and it's my passion and I have the talent which I really, really love. Passion means something that is in you, like something that you know you want to be and something that you love and it cools you down. I have been passionate about ballet for five years now. I was in grade two at my old school and I heard there was um, dancing. I loved it so much and just kept on carrying on and carrying on. I did an exam and my exam mark was about 96. So I was like, yo, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. My family was very proud of me. They were like, just carry on and we'll see what's gonna happen. It felt very good and I wanted to make them proud and well good of having a boy like me. I never actually followed copywriting. It followed me. I used to get interrupted by the commercials while I was doing dishes in the kitchen. Drop the dishes, run to the living room to check out the commercials. And then I started asking myself, who does these things? I've been unemployed for two years in my fault. As a copywriter, you have to be creative. I had to think of something different. That's why I did the poster. I needed to know my market. I started to study something, where companies are located, where media agencies are located. At first, my plan didn't work. But at around half to six, people started taking me pictures. People started to interact with me. There was a point where it was hard. Some people just looked at me and laughed. Others closed their windows and looked the other side. The road started to lose traffic, and I said to myself, let me go, I'll come back tomorrow. But I couldn't come back because my phone kept on ringing. Everyone was calling me. Because of my board, I got four companies who invited me for an interview. I didn't feel ashamed. I was marketing the right people in that way, and it worked. Cool. Okay, um, I'm not gonna give you any heads up about this, because otherwise it makes what I say during it irrelevant, so we'll just get started. Also, when the lights go out, it's a little dark here, so if I fluff my lines, I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> In high school, I was really, really, really into, into drama. I was like head of backstage, involved with all the productions. And I literally had like no idea what I wanted to do. And we had a, um, a guidance counselor and she set me up on a job shadowing experience with a friend's father who's a director. And I went on a series of adverts and just like followed around all the different um, departments. And I was just like in love with this. I literally came home and told my parents, right, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. And they're like, cool, what are you doing for the rest of your life? And I was like, I'm gonna be on set. And they're like, doing what? I'm like, I don't know. Oh, I'll figure that out. And I don't think I actually ever figured it out. Tamarin is a little serious and um, I am the founder of Document It. We make one minute um, documentaries that come out on social media weekly. Um, so the, the thing about 
what we're doing now is you're in a little bit of like a documentary inception. You are watching very loosely, of course, a documentary um, that is still being filmed while you watch it. And we are in the act of preserving our talk about preserve. This documentary is about Document It and my journey to becoming a um, documentary filmmaker. Um, this is very uncomfortable and very awkward and I'm not made for in front of the camera, but I have 60 strangers who have trusted me to put them in front of a camera and to tell their story. And this is my turn to be uncomfortable with them and to also practice what I preach in that I will never ask anyone to do something that I wouldn't be okay with doing myself. Um, so this brings me to this image. That is me when I'm two, and that might as well be my middle name. Sure, I can do that. Um, that gets me into a lot of trouble. I have this ridiculous um, faith in myself that it'll probably just be okay. I'll figure it out later. There's Google. Um, what's the worst that could happen? And that's how all my adventures and mishaps start. Um, much like agreeing to today, <laughs> um, which I'm glad I did. But so I wing things, but and I'm kind of winging this right now, but we didn't wing this. <laughs> this was um, my husband, Andrew, interviewing me. Um, he's also our DOP, graphic designer, not really an animator, animator. Um, edit assistant, the driver, the catering manager, the animal handler, and my head cheerleader. Oh, and the dancer, very important. Um, he's our choreographer. Um, yeah, so he turned the cameras around on me and it was awkward and uncomfortable and as soon as there are cameras facing your way, your words don't go from your brain to your mouth in the same order that you thought them in. Um, and for me, this has been a really valuable lesson because obviously you know that people are gonna be nervous when you're interviewing them, but you actually don't realize how those two little cameras make your blood rise and those two little lights are incredibly bright and they make you want to cry even if you're not sad. It's a weird thing. When I was in third year, our lecturer heard from a, um, an older student or past student about this um, nighttime editing job. So I would go to work at like seven or eight o'clock at night and work until I think it was like three or four the next morning and it was me and three friends and we used to go and edit infomercials. But the thing is, is that like none of us actually knew how to edit in our interview, just like as much editing jargon as what we could like muster was thrown around in that interview and we all got these editing jobs and spent literally from like 7 p.m. until whatever time it was in the morning figuring out how to edit. Needless to say, we kind of all got fired because the work didn't get done, but um, it was a valuable, valuable work experience. And then that, that was just suddenly me. I was like, okay, I'm still in third year, but I'm now an editor. When I finish Varsity, I'm going to be an editor. So after I graduated, I did become an editor um, until one day when our post producer vanished. She just never came back to work, but our deadlines didn't go away. So those little words, sure, I can do that, popped up. And suddenly I was now the post producer who had no idea what was going on, but it was getting done. And I edited a whole bunch of things and this went on until we decided that we were gonna move to London for some adventure. Not all of my jobs have been um, from me speaking before I think. Some of it's necessity um, and when I was in London, that was terrifying. Like being so far away from home and not having a safety net, it was, it was pretty dark, but I'm so grateful for that, even if it's just for the stories. I felt really, really uninspired and I felt like um, a button pusher. There was very little creativity in what I was allowed to do, but also there was very little creativity in the kind of jobs that I was pursuing. So we ended up going to, to London and I did all kinds of things from, um, I worked in a, a bar and I washed dishes and I handed out flyers and, oh yeah, I also, I also cared for all people. 
uh, I had a, a client who had um, Parkinson's and I used to have to go stay over at his house. So it was like this three-story house in Kentish Town in London. And I used to get there at like six, but I'd actually because of the trains, I'd get there at like quarter to six. And I used to just stand there and have a cigarette after cigarette after cigarette because I did not want to go inside. This old man, there was nothing, he wasn't like a terrible human. He's just an old grumpy man who was very, very sick. No one likes being um, less than what they know they can be. And he used to be a lawyer who was in the music industry. And he, I think one of his most famous um, clients was Tom Jones. And so he led this like really big, loud life. And now suddenly he was trapped in this house all the time. So when I got there, he was really grumpy, but like understandably so. And because of his Parkinson's, he had to keep the temperature up all the time so that he wouldn't like his muscles wouldn't like freeze or atrophy. So it was boiling in there. His house smelled like sweat. All he ate was um, chips from McDonald's, which was conveniently located on the corner and was my job to go and fetch. And then he would go to bed at 10 and I'd have to wake up at 12 to make sure he was not just still alive, but that he took his medicine and so that he like would turn over a little bit. And then I'd have to get up at two and at four and then at six again, I could leave. But I slept on the second floor, he slept on the top floor and there was like a baby monitor so he could call me. So you only stay there once a week. So you don't fall into that habit of waking up every two hours. So you set an alarm and sometimes the alarm doesn't go off or sometimes he wakes up early and you have this like old man voice calling you but now he can't remember who's in his house because he has a different carer every day and there's an old man like calling you by the wrong name and then when you do eventually like come out of this creepy dream that this weird voice has created and you actually go upstairs and go see him now he's like the hell in with you because you're not being the attentive carer that he's paying for so that wasn't a job that lasted very long but it was definitely one that like stayed with me and set the stage for future jobs where I, I think I actually became a more empathetic producer and team member and just colleague and it was a hard 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 lesson to learn but one that I'm super super grateful for so in London, I worked for the people who um, made Biker Mice from Mars, but on a very bad knockoff of the Flintstones. I um, worked at the Discovery Channel. I worked at the bar. I spilt red wine on Alan Rickman. That was me. And um, I had adventures that would sustain me for the next eight years. But eventually it was time to come home, and I had possibly the worst full-time job experience anyone could have. And from then on, I just went full, uh, full-time freelance. Um, I've directed, produced, edited, post-produced, production managed, researched. Um, I've found tapes on the other side of the world in libraries. That's the IMDB thing. Um, I've made event decor, write CVs. And all of these things are great. And they've allowed for a lot of cool things. And I've met so many amazing people along the way who I still get to call friends. But I did all of that because of bills. And the problem with that is when you only pursue that, you're actually helping someone else make their dreams come true, which is OK if that's what you want to do. But it wasn't for me. And Andrew at this point was like, OK, 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 that's cool. Let's go back. Can you please tell me why in that job shadowing experience, what about that? made you want to work in this industry like why are we here how did we get here um just talk to me about that i'm making this really long because the section's a little bit longer than i thought my whole directive was to go to every department and meet like as many people as possible and ask them like why they do this and what do they love about it i met so many different people but i think the one person that stood out in my mind was a focus puller i never wanted his job but his enthusiasm for his job and his love for his job, it kind of reminded me as a teenager of that feeling of when you 
listen to like a really, really, really cool song and it amps you up and you like maybe you've got your curtains closed and the lights are off and you're just listening to the song. Like that is the anthem for your life right then and there as a teenager. Like music just has that ability to define a period of your life. And the way this focus puller spoke about his job, I could relate to that in terms of music and how it spoke to my soul maybe. Because I didn't have really much life experience. I'm only 17, I'm in grade 11. But I could relate to that feeling. And I think I was chasing that feeling. And I think I've always been chasing that feeling. I think that's what my whole career has been about. Not just going with the flow, but maybe this time I'll feel like that. So unintentionally, my entire adult life, I've been chasing that feeling that I felt when I was a teenager. And I, like, I used the word chase, but I think actually that's too strong. I was probably like casually strolling after that feeling. Um, it, it, took, it took me some time to figure it out. But I do know that when I did start making some decisions for myself, we were in New York for a friend's birthday and I suddenly found this place that I really wanted to be. But how, how do we get to stay? So the plan was to study, after which we would get a working holiday visa and naturally our employers would love us so much that they would sponsor us and we could just stay forever, in theory. I decided I wanted to study documentary filmmaking. I just realized like I actually always gravitate to watching um, non-fiction over fiction and, and what I read is pretty much the same. I love, 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 love true crime podcasts. I'm a bit of a nerd about it. As soon as I saw the, the school's program and the courses that were available, I was like, wait, why haven't I done that? Like unintentionally, this is what I've been gravitating to for years. Why haven't I done that? So for about five years, I've just been telling people, I'm gonna to go to film school and I'm gonna study documentary filmmaking. Up, up until about March, 2018, I went with the flow and I took any freelance job basically that came my way if I was available, whether that be in print or animation or live action or event decor or like anything. And it's been cool. It's allowed me to do a lot of um, traveling. It's allowed me to um, pay for a wedding. It's allowed us to buy a house. Um, we have a dog. Like it's allowed a lot of cool things to happen in my life. But that has always been the one area where I have never really been happy. Um, not unhappy, mostly, but never really happy. Pretty much work had dried up. And I would say for like six years prior to that, I didn't ever struggle. I was always able to fill my time. And then suddenly I had all this time and I couldn't do anything. It took about two or three months of me unintentionally soul searching to figure out what I wanted to do. And I just said to, to Andrew, why don't we just make one minute documentaries, you know, like that's the length of a video that it's allowed on Instagram. We have some of the gear where we use some of our, the money that we got from our wedding as a, as a gift and just buy gear. And obviously all the money that we got from film schools was saved for, for film school. Let's just use that and buy gear and let's make one minute documentaries and let's like, let's just see what happens. Andrew was like, yeah, let's do it. And that was like the beginning of something that I think has changed my life forever. So from that first conversation to getting everything set up and the first um, documented coming out, it took about two months. Andrew's also the chief namer of things. So he came up with the name and I told him how I wanted it to look and feel. Um, and he designed everything and Soma just learned how to animate um, casually. Um, I put up a post on, on Facebook asking for stories and my friend's mom said, you need to speak to my friend. And it happened. 
My grandson calls me the cool granny usually, but I am more commonly known as Deborah Darling, <laughs> funnily enough. I found um, Humans of New York and it had only been going maybe six months. And in one night I read like every single post and, and looked at every single photo that he, that he had online and I just fell in love with it. The concept of taking photos of normal people and telling their stories was just like, just genius to me. One day I got a notification followed quickly by another notification. I'd been tagged in a post and it was on a Humans of New York um, post that said something to the effect of coming to Johannesburg, looking for a fixer, and Deborah Darling had tagged me in the comments. In that moment, I, I just, all I could hear in my head was my dad saying, if you don't ask, you don't get. And I didn't give it any more thought than quickly write in this email that said, you know, I live in Joburg, I'm a producer, I'm not a fixer, I don't speak any other languages, but I want to help. I just want to be part of something really cool, you don't have to pay me, um, I just really would love to work with you. And I just, I sent the email off, decided not to think about it again because I wasn't the right person. I wasn't the person that he was looking for. I wasn't the person that he needed help from. So it wasn't going to happen. Just out of nowhere, I got an email from, from Humans of New York and like my heart just stopped. It was literally from Brandon Stanton himself. He, was, he just said, you know, my um, assistant forwarded me your mail. I'm in Joburg right now. I have been um, getting some stories, but people largely are tucked away behind high walls or in malls or whatever. So the people that I have access to um, all have really, really understandably sad stories. And I don't want to paint that as the only side there is to Johannesburg. Do you know of any people who have really positive stories that I could interview? I responded so quickly saying, no problem. I can send you some people that I've already interviewed. Let me speak to them, see if they're available. And I just started phoning people. We met at Sioux Lake and we did interviews. And between, between waiting for people to arrive, he suddenly just asked me um, more about myself. And when I started telling him my story, he's like, I'm sorry, I have to stop you right there. I need to interview you as well for Humans of New York. And then, like, just, just that feeling, like, my, I think my heart fell out of my chest. I was like, what? This is, this is, yes. When the post came out, not only did he tell my story, he did a shout out in the comments for Document It. And, and I woke up on a Sunday night in early November to my phone going berserk. People were just like following and following and following on Instagram and on Facebook and on Twitter. And within not even 24 hours, I got over um, 50,000 followers across Instagram and, and Facebook. It was just overwhelming. And I just sat on the couch and just watched it happen. And it was just like, it was just going and going and going. And there wasn't a single negative comment. Um, there wasn't a single thing that made me feel weird. There was only people from all over the world just telling me to keep going and keep doing it. And it was amazing. So I kept going and life has never been the same. This was last Friday. I got invited to go to a Muslim family's iftar dinner to um, break their fast with them. The next day, I got to go watch these little girls skateboard. The following day, I woke up really early to join Zoe, who's also here, and her mom go um, for a ride out by the cradle of humankind. The weekend before, I got to go to Ponty, and I've always wanted to go there. The weekend before that, I went to um, this thing called Sound System where they put up these speakers in parks in townships and blast reggae for the residents to just dance like no one's watching. 
The thing about Documented is that every time I make one, I'm so excited for the next one. And as a result, I'm running out of Wednesdays because I film so far in advance. Um, so the plan is to try and get it sponsored so that we can post two a week. When I took Brandon Stanton back to the airport that day, he told me it would be like this. He says, the images are beautiful, but there's magic in the story. And he was right. On the top level, like what, what documented is about, is about documenting, preserving cultures and people and their stories and history as it's happening. And we're creating like a, like a catalog of the way things are now. On the one hand, it's given me this platform to use everything that I've learned throughout my, my working career, that everything that I have preserved about myself and my skills and my experiences. And I brought it all together and I can use it to do this one thing. I get to meet new people and, and different people and travel to different places and continue to tell these stories. And then on the other hand, what it's also doing is preserving that, not just history, but that feeling of Ubuntu. And not, not necessarily for everyone, but for me, because I'm suddenly starting to realize how much all these strangers mean to me. Every one of these videos is like a song that I heard when I was a teenager. I get to create these videos which are so important to the person who is in them and people who have seen them or people who haven't even yet seen them. But I'm creating my own little bits of music that when I go back and watch them, I remember how I felt that day when I interviewed that person or how I felt when I got that comment from someone who said, thank you, this is wonderful. This means the world to me. I didn't know about this. This is exciting. And unintentionally, I have created the job that that focus puller made me wish I would have one day. And it's just the best thing I've ever done in my whole life. So um, I think that brings us to the question part of the session. Does anyone have anything or should I just keep telling the stories? Hi. Hi. <clears throat> um, so my question is basically, is this now your full time, you just do docu document it or are you diversifying in terms of other media, maybe different brands, your own brand? So it's, so the plan is to go just document it like that's the goal but um with everything it takes time also so tired of eating too many noodles like <laughs> so tired so right now document it is a little bit like my show reel or our show reel um and in the last month for the first time we've been commissioned and we got two deposits on one day um, so we're making documentary brand films, um, one of which is being shown in um, Canada right now at the Coin Geek conference, and then we've been commissioned to make a half an hour um, documentary. Um, I do still um, freelance as a as a producer, um, but only for people that I really love. <laughs> it's not it's not my jam anymore. So listening to your story, I could see many different themes about preservation. Because looking at you working in London, you said it was just for the bills. That's preservation, that's self-preservation in a sense. But now looking at the work you're doing now and trying to make sure you do something which makes you, for lack of a better word, happy, 
is also a preservation of your identity, who you are, and self-expression. So looking at the you now shooting documentaries and they can only last one minute, how do you pick what to preserve in that one minute and how has your entire life helped you pick those moments because of the experiences you've gone through? That is an amazing question. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you for picking up on the self-preservation thing. Um, I didn't have enough time to talk about that aspect as well. Um, yeah, so in terms of, uh, there are a few questions in there, so if I don't get them, I'll just yell. Um, so in terms of how I choose what goes into the minute, um, well, one of the reasons it is only a minute is not just because of, of Instagram, but because people don't have time anymore. Um, and a minute is a, a bit of time that you can spare, that people are willing to spare. Um, so the whole mission is in a minute, tell people exactly what they need to know. Um, a lot of the stuff is just fluffy detail. Um, and if you, so I don't start out with a minute, like I start out like sometimes with like an 18 minute uh, and I have to cut it down to one minute. And it's just about going, if I don't keep this in, will people still know what's going on? And it's just like, pull it out, pull it out, pull it out. Um, it's like destructive editing almost. But besides just will people understand the story, will people feel the story? Because if you're going to give me one minute, I need to make that minute worth it. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do there. Um, and then what informs what I put in these documentaries, I think, I think it goes back to, to music. So I have a very um, strong relationship with music because of my father. I actually worked at Look and Listen. That was like my first job out of high school. Literally like matric exams ended and the very next day I was like, hey, Look and Listen, I am here. And I stayed there for like three years. Um, and music has always been a very, very big part of my life. And I think that getting that emotion and getting that little bit, like what do you take away from a song? Um, I think that is kind of how I feel my way through these documentaries. I, I have no training in documentary filmmaking. I only have what I feel. Did I miss anything? Thank you. Hi. Um, I must commend that this is one of the most um, inspiring and creative morning session that I've been to. Thank you. Um, I just want to know, in your line of work, there must be some time where you get so scared of, your, of what you do. And um, do you ever get scared of the challenges that comes with your work? And how do you get through it? Um, like I have a philosophy in life and it's the sure I can do that. Um, it's kind of like this blinker that makes me do things even if I'm scared. Like you just run at the problem because it's not gonna go away if you don't face it. And it's like that with a deadline, it's like that with a difficult client, it's like that with technology issues. Like yesterday it took seven hours to export this, this guy. There are always problems, but you literally just have to go through it and when you get to the other side you realize that it actually wasn't as hard as what you thought it would be um, there's there's no no recipe for being successful other than just just go and do it but do it because you want to because otherwise there's something else waiting for you I think anything else hi how do you find how do you like find Okay, so um, I sometimes put out calls on Facebook just to my, to my friends. I'll find a topic and be like, I want to know more about tap dancing. Anyone know a tap dancer? And then people will send me in stories, and I usually don't find the tap dancer. I find someone else. Um, or you get introduced to people like Deborah Darling, who then introduces you to um, Alex, the doll maker, who then has introduced me to like four other people. So it like it snowballs, and you kind of go down all these little avenues. Um, I also just read a lot, follow the news. My sister is one hell of a uh, 
she's not a, technically a researcher, but she's definitely like a resharer on, on Facebook. So she's sent me a lot of really cool stuff. And also, like, my sisters do really cool things. Um, my one sister is in, in the UK studying to be an archaeologist, so I'm waiting for that to kick in so that I can get some stories there. But um, my sister who's here is a publisher um, of um, niche genre. So she knows all of these very, very interesting characters who are outside of the norm. She had to create this publishing company to find a home for these people. And they're all amazing. And that's where like the stories about the illustrators and Comic-Con and the cosplayers and all of those stories have come from. So largely it's about reading and just talking to people, basically. No one. Cool. It's difficult for me to th think about preservation without thinking about the way we work, maybe especially at big corporates, mm -hmm. where to preserve myself and my job, right? I have to do A, B, and C, which might put someone else at a disadvantage. So looking at all the work you've done, you've obviously had an awesome team behind you. How have you been able to resolve conflicts where it seems like for someone to preserve what matters to them, it's at odds with maybe what matters to you? How do you decide who you fight for to keep on your journey of preservation and who to let go, not because you hate them, but sometimes just how life works? That is something that I have to work on all the time. Um, because of my, sure, I can do that, I um, often take on more than what I should. Um, and that's not just with like work, but in um, relationships or, um, no, 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 don't do that, I can help you. Um, and that I'm having to learn is not necessarily good for me. Um, I did, a big, a big part of the 11 years of helping other people reach their goals has been about playing the middleman, about compromising, and about um, making sure that we get there together. So like as a, as a producer, my, my thing is that I wouldn't ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. So if I have a team of animators who are working over the weekend, I'll go and sit there with them. I might not have anything to do, but I'll go and be there with them because if they must do it, I must do it. Um, so that has been my approach to work, which has I found in terms of working with people been very, very, very beneficial. Because um, when I ask someone to do something, they know I wouldn't ask them if I didn't need to. Um, and, and in terms of preserving like my own goals, um, every, everything that I did before Document It was what made Document It. Like I, um, Actually, I have to share this with you. Maybe now's the right time. So I follow a lot of random people on Instagram. They don't always necessarily stay around, but I follow different people to just see different things and whatever. And there's a lady whose account I'm still getting to, to know. Her name's Justina Blakely, uh, Blakeney. And two days ago, she posted this thing that said, um, all those years you thought you were faking it, you didn't realize that you were actually practicing. And that's it. That's, that's it, like what, what we're doing now isn't necessarily what we're gonna be doing forever, but what we did back then is gonna help us later, even if it's because we choose not to do that thing anymore. So unintentionally, we're preserving everything we've learned, even if we never use it again. We're like creating our own little catalog of the way forward. Cool. <laughs>